Welcome to Indianomics. As India's G20 presidentship comes to a close, what are India's achievements in the past one year? Is there a plan to make the multilateral development banks work better for low-income countries and climate change? And what is the state of the global economy with the Fed continuing to tighten? How bad is the China slowdown? For all these very critical questions, I have with me one most appropriate to answer them, Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanian, India's former chief economic advisor and now executive director representing India on the IMF board. Dr. Subramanian, thank you very much indeed for joining us in our studio. My pleasure, Lata. Thank you. Well, let me start with, you know, this G20 and the World Leaders Summit. Uh, what is the signal achievement? I would rank uh, at least two or three very key achievements. Let me start with uh, the global uh, debt restructuring roundtable. If we look at the global economy, uh, debt distress is a very key issue. The common framework uh, that uh, had existed within the G20 had some issues with it, especially the fact that it was not applicable to some of the middle-income countries like Sri Lanka, for instance. Um, secondly, you know, over the last decade and especially post-COVID, uh, many creditors that are outside the Paris Club have become dominant. Um, and, and these countries are ones where the decision-making process, especially with respect to debt restructuring, has been slow because it tends to be centralized, it tends to be sometimes opaque as well. And as you would appreciate, Lata, you know, in any situation of debt restructuring, time is of essence. Um, and I think in this uh, particular case, the Global Debt Restructuring Roundtable, I think will be a telling contribution that India will make um, by expanding it to countries that are beyond the, you know, the current, fra the common framework, um, and also bringing in processes that will actually ensure that decision making will be fast. Um, so that I think I would rank as the, you know, the most important contribution. Second, and I think this is something, the contribution of which will be there uh, over time, is demonstrating and taking the leadership, you know, in technology being for the, you know, for common good, but across the board. Um, and, and I think what better country than India to demonstrate this? Uh, just recently, we saw, you know, over 500 million accounts being created, Jandhana Bank, you know, accounts. So uh, this initiative for financial inclusion, and I think India having already done it, um, will be taking the leadership, uh, the Global Forum for Financial Inclusion. Uh, relatedly, also the public digital infrastructure yes. um, and I think especially the way in which we handled COVID, the demand side push that we gave of, was very well targeted because we relied on this public digital infrastructure. So showing that public digital infrastructure can be used in times of crisis but also in good times to, to enable productivity you know, improvements, I think that will be a second contribution in general showing technology for, for the you know, broader good. Also, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, in terms of an idea, this idea of life, which is lifestyle for environment, I think, it's, you know, the impact of this will be seen over time. Because, you know, this has been in part of India's ethos, where not only do we talk about, you know, economic growth, but we also talk about economic growth in a sustainable manner. And the idea of life is therefore, I think, you know, uh, exemplification of that ethos. So altogether, if we put, you know, I think uh, it'll be a telling contribution, um, uh, which will be consistent with the kind of stature that India now brings in the global uh, you know, economy. Oh, absolutely. I think the last point you make is uh, well taken. Uh, Indian ethos always appreciates man as part of nature yes. and not man over nature. Correct. You know, the jivas, jivo jivas se bojanam yes. kind of uh, uh, place that the human uh, species has. Okay, let me come to, uh, you know, you touched upon the debt restructuring and obviously China is a big factor in that. Uh, but China itself is bedeviled with this debt deflation loop. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, in your perch uh, at the IMF, you will be better able to educate us. How serious is that problem? Uh, do you see a prolonged Chinese slowdown? I actually fear that, Lata. Um, because uh, some of the problems that the Chinese economy now is facing is structural. Um, and I think it's a twofold problem. First is the, is the demographics. Uh, if you, you know, rewind back to the 1980s, um, you know, China was, was basically looking at a demographic dividend. Um, you know, huge increase in the working, uh, you know, population. But over the next two decades, uh, the, that working population is going to decline by about 300 million. Mm -hmm. 300 million. You know, that's, that's a huge. very, very it's large fifth number. of the population. Yes. Um, 
and you know that will of course then lead you know lead to loss of competitiveness because you know the economic model that china has pursued is one of you know utilizing the large population as a, a, a big strength but wages will go up because you know supply of you know uh, workforce will will de decline but at the same time uh, you know one of the things that china has been trying to do uh, after the global financial crisis which is to enhance domestic consumption uh, the decline in this you know working population will also not help but I, there's a bigger problem that i think uh, is something that they have to contend with and this is something that you know india went through but has you know emerged very successfully which is the financial sector yes um, now you know if you look at china China's growth happened through investment. You know, at its peak, for instance, they were touching investment as a proportion of GDP close to 50%, 48% to be precise. Um, but some of that has led to a lot of bad investment as well. And as we've seen in India itself, when you actually do not clean up the balance sheets mm -hmm. very quickly, that leads to evergreening of loans, that leads to zombie lending. And as I've always maintained, you know, uh, you know with you and elsewhere, whenever problems start from the financial sector the overhang of that is very very long and because a lot of the lending you know whether it's to the real estate whether it is actually to the municipalities have all been done by institutions with soft budget constraints you know not hard budget constraints uh, some of the opac you know opacity that prevails actually will mean that the restructuring of these balance sheets clean up of that may not happen Im Im immediately and that is why i think uh, you know I, I fear that some of the problems, the demographics, together with the sort of the investment model having run its course now, yes. I think means that the problems are structural. Yes, over-invested, over-supplied and over-leveraged. Over-leveraged. No. And I think over-leveraged exactly the way in which India faced, which is both, you know, corporates, you know, banks, but also some of the real estate sector as well. I think so, you know, uh, I think that to me is the is the sort of worry in terms of the uh, next se several years. Mm -hmm. But the demographics will certainly be a big, big headwind. That's structural. Uh, yeah, how they are able to delever the local governments and the local government financial vehicles is uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, the big question. Yes. But now that brings us to what it means for us. So do you think that this is a disinflationary force? Mm -hmm. uh, to that extent, do you think people like India don't have to worry at least about core inflation? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, I think overall, if you look at um, the Chinese deflation, I think will mean good news for uh, inflation, you know, or fighting inflation globally. Mm. Because um, if you look at, you know, many of the advanced economies, whether it's the United States or Europe, a lot of their, you know, uh, imports and especially some of the consumption comes from China. And to that extent, actually, the deflation in China will help in easing some of these inflationary pressures. Um, I think for India as well, you know, it, it, it'll help. Uh, but I would also, you know, uh, note that combined with this good news, I think there is some, you know, sort of worrying news on the supply side on crude front. Uh, you know, I think with the US, uh, you know, strategic oil reserves sort of really dipping um, and, you know, uh, uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia, actually, I think at least for the for the for this year, putting a squeeze on supply, I think uh, crude oil price. So so there are sort of uh, competing pressures here. I, I think the demand side, there's good news because uh, on the inflation front, at yes. least um, because the deflation in China will uh, will help. But I think the supply is mitigating that that good news on the no, demand I side. agree I agree we do have bad news or at least difficult news in terms of fuel and food yes and uh, this perhaps is a small mitigant Correct. but let me come therefore to the heart of the problem or you know the global cost of money which the US decides in a way yeah uh, what's your sense uh, uh, the latest ISM numbers services numbers are still very strong mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh, one more rate hike still uh, there if not September sometime my sense is the rate uh, you know, tightening or the monetary tightening cycle may be coming to an end in the US. Um, so if you look at the, you know, the signals that are coming out in the United States, the sort of conflicting. On the one hand, you have Goldman Sachs saying that the probability of recession has declined from 20% to 15%. Yeah. At the same time, you have Bloomberg saying that the probability of re recession is more than half. So two, you know, commentators <laughs> saying opposite things. Similarly, if you look at the, the, the labor data, you know, on the one hand, the last prints showed that more than 180,000 jobs created overall. But if you look at, you know, sort of uh, open the hood and start looking, about 20% of metros are actually seeing, uh, you know, unemployment rates that are, you know, are at one-year highs yes. compared to the, you know, uh, 
the lows that were there. Uh, and these account for about one quarter of overall employment. So even on employment, the macro versus the sort of the, the micro seems to be at conf in, in conflict. But I think the uh, other key fact that I would look at is, is the fact that M2, you know, which is basically what the US uses uh, to, to measure broad money, uh, has declined for the first time in 70 years. Okay. Um, I think that is something which I would actually, you know, uh, uh, combining it with, uh, you know, the book that we have, Money as Zero Sum Game, if you bring some of those ideas in, I think it's good news on the inflation front because actually there'll be less money chasing goods. Um, but at the same time, the decline in the broad money, a large part of that is coming from bank lending, not, 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 not increasing. And that is something which actually we'll have to wait and watch because it could actually mean if bank lending is declining, that may be that some corporates may not be able to continue the refinancing their loans. Uh, to what extent that leads to, you know, possible distress on the corporate side, that is something that will have to be wait and, you know, one, one has to wait and watch. At the same time, even on the banking sector, the discount window that the Fed had brought in March after the, some of the, you know, uh, 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 bank, bank uh, problems that they saw, those, you know, we'll have to wait because it was a one-year window and come uh, March of 2024, my sense is it'll have to be actually, you know, the can will have to be sort of kicked down the road for one more year at least because rates have not declined as much as they would have wanted for some of the book losses actually to be, to be sort of, you know, uh, retrieved. So I think I would say cautiously uh, um, sort of optimistic on the U.S. side. Europe, though, you know, if you look at, um, so on the one hand, if you look at inflation, 3.2% was the latest print in the US, 5.3% in Europe. Uh, growth last, you know, second quarter, 2.1% in the US, only 0.6% in, in Europe. So I think Europe is, is, you know, tighter spot. And as I was saying with China, I think Europe also has structural problems. So growth may continue to be anemic, anemic there. Um, so overall, I think uh, uh, global economy, is facing headwinds. Okay. That's 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 my sense. But I think India, uh, you know, uh, is is in a good spot. Oh yes, it is. And we have to get much more out of you from what you make of the Indian situation in a minute after a break. Welcome back to this very special chat we are having with uh, Dr. Krishnamurti Subramaniam, the Executive Director at the IMF for India and of course the former CEA. Uh, Dr. Krishnamurti just laid out uh, how the global economy is panning out and as you pointed out, Dr. Uh, uh, Subramaniam, you know, the US may be at the end of rate hikes yeah. but uh, chances of a cut perhaps are not there as you pointed out, uh, the labour market is yeah. showing signs of tightness as well as uh, some uh, giveaway. Yes. Now, what does that mean for India? If, as we now see, the dollar is at $105 strong, uh, US 10-year yields are at 4.3, does that also crimp our ability to, you know, uh, cut? And maybe does it even put an upward pressure? So, you know, Lata, I have actually felt that, um, especially after the pandemic, India has been able to successfully uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, reduce its dependence or linkage with the with with us um, you would recall you know our economic policy was very different in the united yes. states we focused you know very much on supply demand side we actually as we just spoke you know use the public digital infrastructure to really uh, um, push on demand so reason i'm bringing that, that up is actually is our monetary policy is really catering to factors that India is facing, yes. not as much driven by, you know, by, by U.S. factors. No, the only problem is that if the dollar is strong yeah. and if U.S. interest rates are high, yeah. exporters will not want to bring in the money immediately. Importers will not want to book yeah. forward. No, I think that's, know, there is a bit of an uh, impact on exchanges. I agree. I think that is actually something that does play out in the short run. Um, but... Uh, won't impact are, policy. Yeah, yeah, I think primarily India's, you know, and, and I think monetary policy will be focused primarily on our own inflation uh, front. And here I think if you look at, even though the latest print was 7.4%, large part of that was driven by food inflation. Yes. Which is something that monetary policy cannot control. Um, and it's primarily, you know, supply side, for instance, vegetable prices, and yes. I think even, you know, uh, uh, oil prices have actually contributed to that, which, uh, you know, monetary policy cannot contribute to that much. So overall, I think, um, you know, our monetary policy will be driven primarily by our domestic 
genetic factors. Yes. And here, some, here I have actually maintained that, you know, unlike in the advanced economies, you know, in India, the part of consumption that is actually sensitive to interest rates is much lower. In India, for instance, you know, you and I will relate, none of us will ever borrow to actually go and eat food or to go on a vacation. Um, we might borrow to actually buy a two-wheeler or a four-wheeler or maybe a house, but that's it. So it's only the durable goods and maybe housing that actually depends on interest rates. So the part of consumption that re or consumption demand, because when I talk about demand, I like you know separating between consumption demand and investment demand. Consumption demand, I think, is not as interest rate sensitive, okay. but investment demand is, is very, very interest rate interest sensitive. sensitive. And as you know, uh, I've always argued, uh, you would recall from the 2018-19 economic survey, growth depends on investment through the virtuous cycle. And therefore, investment demand is something that has to be looked at. Um, overall, so I would see that, uh, you know, that our monetary policy should really be driven by what is happening. Even though there are some you know, uh, uh, sort of considerations that you are bringing in in the short run, which I'm not denying, but you know, from a from from sort of a priority perspective, I think our monetary policy has to be just focused on our, our own factors. Yeah, but uh, you know, there is a El Nino issue that can linger yes, on, and yes. therefore, I mean, rate cuts is difficult. Would you say? Um, so, as I said, I think you know, overall, if at all, there is a possibility that. Uh, the inflation will continue. I think it may not. If you look at tomato prices, for instance, I was just looking at, I think since 8th of August, they've started declining. Um, some of these prices... The cereals are still 30%. Cereals are still... Uh, the w one nuance that I will introduce with cereals, though, is especially the bottom of the pyramid is not impacted by cereals because they actually get free food mm -hmm. from the PDS. So I think cereals will not have as much of an impact on the budget of the poor. Um, mm -hmm. And as we know, inflation is actually is a bigger tax on the poor. So cereals, therefore, actually, we have to make a distinction okay. versus others. So overall, I will therefore say because this, you know, any element of inflation that is coming in, it's not as much core, which seems to be quite stable. It is primarily, you know, food and maybe to some extent, maybe oil now with actually oil sort of being close to $90. Yes. Um, and those are not things that monetary policy can do much about. So I would suggest that you know we basically continue focusing on giving as much momentum to growth as possible, mm -hmm. while of course making sure that inflation does not go too much you know off the okay. head. But what's your uh, uh, estimate of growth itself? You know, both the budget and the RBI have mm -hmm. a forecast of six and a half percent. Yeah. But then there is this uh, inflationary tax on whatever little bit of consumption. Uh, and there is crude. Mm -hmm. So uh, you think uh, uh, 6.5 now becomes a bit aspirational? Um, my sense is, yes, you know, if you look at the first quarter number, 7.8%, yes. um, which is very much in the ballpark of, you know, of expectation. Um, so I should think that 6.5 should be achievable. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, despite some of the global factors that are that that are there, I think we have to keep watching what is happening on the agriculture side. If we look at the latest quarter numbers, um, growth in agriculture has not been as good this particular quarter. So I think that's something which we have to. Uh, but if we look at some of the uh, you know uh, private investment that is coming in, I was just looking at the latest monthly economic report that the Ministry of Finance put out. Um, you know, private investment uh, I think that is coming in is at a 14-year high. Those are all good things. I think which will really help um, and of course the you know what was started in you know in 2021 budget the infrastructure spending is continuing so overall i think 6.5% is something we should be able to achieve okay no the worry also is that as we get close to elections yeah. the capex uh, the government may have other uh, uses for money mm -hmm. and also because we're heading towards uh, you know higher inflation so will there be more revenue expenditure mm -hmm. and will also private capex hesitate like just let this uncertainty get out so can we see a slowdown? So I think that's that's a good question. My response would be that, you know, if we just see the bu budgeted capex, actually itself is very, you know, is high. Um, and once it's been budgeted, it is essentially for the line ministries to spend that budgeted amounts. Um, and that is something, you know, from my experience uh, in North Block is, is essentially monitored by, 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 by the cabinet secretary, for instance. Um, so my sense is that I think the budgeted capex is something- Will not line, be taken away. Yeah, will not be taken away for sure. Um, so line ministries have to go and basically spend that. Um, so I don't foresee necessarily, um, you know, 
a decline in capex. At the same time, one of the key aspects in the budget was also, you know, incentives to states, states. to spend through the, you know, uh, um, sort of these these loans. And I think that also will hold yes. because many of the states are, except for I think two or three which are going into elections, others mm -hmm. don't have to to cut back on that. So my sense is capex should not get impacted that much. Now, when it comes to inflation, if anything, you know, additional revenue expenditure will only sort of, you know, spur inflation. So that is not a good reason to, to increase to revenue increase. Expendi expenditure. Um, so if anything, you know, I would say that um, revenue expenditure should be maintained as, as it is so that inflation does not become a worry. Um, so overall, I think uh, I don't see any reason for us to capex. be pessimistic, you know, on, on CapEx. Okay. Well, now let me come to the larger story. You know, since you're in the IMF and you're seeing comparative rates of growth, does it look like we are going to be at the six and a half, seven percent, or even a better handle? Because this is our demographic dividend decade. So, do you think even seven will look pale and we'll do better? So th th that's uh, you know a good question. In fact. I just am uh, finishing up a working paper estimating the potential growth for India. I should be putting it up, you know, in maybe a you know, couple of weeks. Um, so where we've estimated the, the growth for uh, India using... So there's a paper by a former governor, uh, C. Rangarajan, in the EPW. And, you know, they estimate uh, growth using a sort of a disaggregated structural model, you know, across eight sectors, taking, you know, into impact what will be the rate of growth of investment, what will be the productivity change Based on that, what we are estimating is that even in its, so the baseline estimation is if we do the same rate of growth of investment as we've had over the last 10 years, not the last 20 years, you know, okay. if you would last yeah, 10 years, which is a conservative estimate. Yes. Um, and if our productivity is the same as the median over the last, you know, 20 years, which means basically nothing very different, we should be able to get a growth of 7%. That's oh. the baseline. Um, now, the pessimistic scenario is where if we actually have, because of global factors and other external factors, let's say investment rate, you know, growth of rate of investment is, about, is at the 40th percentile, not the median. Mm. And productivity also happens to be at the 40th percentile, then we should be able to get 6% growth. If you're able to do better, for instance, instead of being at the 40th or the median, we're able to get to the 60th percentile in terms of the rate of growth of investment and productivity as well. We can actually go, you know, close to 8% or beyond as well. So overall, I think the demographics now is something that is a very, very important. In fact, I'll, I will go to the extent of saying that the next 20, 25 years, this is an opportunity for India that comes once in a few centuries. Yes. Because, you know, we have the opportunity to actually grow and become possibly one of the top two economies. And so the next 25 years, India cannot afford to miss. We have to get our policy right because an opportunity like this comes once in a few centuries. Okay. I would lean towards eight because I think we have the demographic dividend and we have a digital dividend as well. Absolutely. You so, said it. You said it because, you know, I think that is where really, as we spoke about earlier as well, you know, uh, um, not only can we improve productivity significantly um, from the digital dividend, but also the infrastructure that we've created that will also so enha enhance productivity, but we can do this in an inclusive manner. And I think that is something which is very important because when we think about reforms for growth, etc., in earlier times, though, you know, because growth may not have been seen to be inclusive, there may have been headwinds coming from that. But now the technology and the digital in public infrastructure can generate inclusive growth and therefore, therefore buy in for reforms on growth as well. So I think that's good news. Again, I'll reiterate, the next 25 years are really critical for India. Once in us, you know, uh, uh, opportunity, once in a few centuries opportunity for us to really spear ahead. So the uh, key headline for me from what you have said is that uh, the next 25 years are critical, but I think the bigger headline for me is that we should do at 8%. And I think I have you on my side or I'm on your side. Well, on that optimistic note, we wrap up this very interesting chat uh, with uh, the former CEA, Dr. Subramanian, now IMF ED. Thank you very much, Mr. Subramanian, for dropping in. My pleasure, Dr.